Um, uh, you have the slides that I posted as always in Canvas, uh, so make sure to check that and the papers that I keep posting that have the summaries of, or an extended summary of what I can cover here in class, okay? Um, so just to give you a very quick overview because it's extremely important, we'll be using that throughout the course. Um, in many instances, we, or most instances, I'd say we are going to estimate the underlying density of our data, our simple data, by using a mixture of models. Uh, typically, or most commonly, people use a mixture of Gaussians, but you can use a mixture of a variety of distributions. This is the, uh, these are the generic uh, descriptions that I provided or I derived on the board last time. Um, you have here the uh, f of x given this um, upsilon. Upsilon, remember, are the parameters of our mixture. So for each of the densities, we have theta i that correspond to these parameters of that distribution plus the uh, priors. And because all the priors are up to one, I only need to include g minus one, which is the number of distributions that I have. Uh, these are the models that, well, I drew this model on the board, and this is another model. And if you haven't done that already, uh, go home tonight, open MATLAB, implement these two very simple mixtures, right, and play with them, see how, they, how this works. Um, to find the parameters, we did what we always do. Um, in that case, we compute the log likelihood, and from that, we take the derivative, and from the, or the partial derivative back to the parameters, and from that we get the, uh, these equations. The problem with these equations is that uh, one depends on the other, so we cannot use a closed form solution to find the result of the parameters, because to find the results of um, this, for example, I need to know the prior, right? Right here. But to know the prior, I need to know this. So <laughs> I'm stuck, right? Um, solution, I iterate, right? I start with an initial estimate of, say, the priors, and from that initial estimate of the priors, I can compute the posterior, and from the posterior, I can compute the priors, and so on, I can iterate, and we derive, this is the idea behind the EM, or uh, expectation maximization algorithm, that we derive on the board, um, and here are the equations that we have. Remember, um, you want to first calculate the expected value, which is shown here. That expected value is, of course, with respect to the parameters at time t. It's important to note that the parameters are given at a specific time. And this is the maximization, where you find the parameter values that maximize this expectation. Um, these are the equations for the mixture of Gaussians. Uh, this is an example of this working in 1D and 2D. So here, the black dots that you see, these are uh, the samples that represent one class, and here are the samples that represent another class or another cluster. And here, the same in 2D. You have this two-dimensional representation here. The density is shown here on top in that three-dimensional plot, right? But typically, remember that we're going to draw this one, this two-dimensional with these uh, shapes on the two-dimensional feature space, right? So in this top one, you may just start with this, um, uh, with this distribution here, right? And then over time, you will converge to this other distribution, right? Uh, here's an example, a more complex example with a, a set of points that define this uh, nice uh, circle or uh, circular uh, inner motion of the samples, if you will. And then over time, um, this is actually not the best representation, but you start at random and over time it gets, um, it converges to, to this nice result. Remember that we have to assume that we know the number of densities or models here. Um, there are ways to select this number of models. You have that and the slides and the material that I gave you, but these methods don't generally work really well. You cannot use base, remember, because base says, well, the optimal solution is one Gaussian per sample. Um, yeah, thank you very much, we knew that. Um, the other ones, basically what they're based on is 
uh, maximize base, right? Or minimize the base error or maximize the base likelihood. Um, and add an additional constraint that computes the complexity of that solution. And the complexity is given by the number of models, right? The more models that you have, the more complexity you have and you have to find a compromise. And we'll talk more when we talk about regression in a couple weeks uh, or less. We'll talk more about um, this uh, different types of optimization on finding equilibriums and we'll talk about Nash equilibrium and other things that one can use when we have more than one uh, optimization function. Um, as I said, as I alluded to in our last lecture, you can convert this mixture of normal distributions into what's called a hard clustering or hard division of classes um, by imposing that the prior be either one or zero, right? So that each sample can only belong to one of uh, my priors. And this is called k-means. And k-means, um, it has a very simple implementation, right? Because the equation simplify dramatically when you do that and it runs really fast. So k-means is typically used as an initialization to mixture model, mixture of normal models, right, or mixture of Gaussian. So um, you have all these methods implemented in MATLAB and all the other um, uh, toolboxes that you have out there. So you just do k-means first and then mixture of Gaussian second, right, if you are to, if you want to do that. Um, so this would be the difference. Remember, this is the 2D view of that 3D uh, density that we were looking at earlier. This would be a soft clustering and this would be a hard clustering. Um, by clustering, what we mean is that until now, remember, you know, we've talked, when we talk about classification, we talk about supervised. Right? We talk about supervised learning. Well, this is one option. Our second option is what's called unsupervised. Now, unsupervised learning um, is obviously the holy grail. I give you data, because data these days especially, data is cheap, right? Um, data is available everywhere. I give you data, and you just learn from that data. The problem is that most machine learning algorithms require that this data be labeled, right? And therefore, I can use the supervised methods that we are describing. Um, but what happens if your data is not labeled? Well, then you have to use unsupervised because you no longer have the labels, so you don't have a supervision of what you can do and cannot do. Um, clustering is a way to address this. Right? By clustering, you have a number of data points that you know may correspond to a number of unknown distributions, right? And you have to find both the number of distributions and uh, the densities of each of these uh, distributions. So it's a very hard problem. And we'll talk more about this at the end of the course, the last uh, few weeks. Um, it's obviously the, the uh, one, uh, one of the current most important topics in machine learning that people are working on. It's extremely interesting, but um, really difficult problem. But we'll talk more about it once we have more knowledge, okay? Um, uh, we derived last time the equations for mixture of normal models here. I have included you the derivations of mixture of T distribution or student T distributions. Um, because Gauss, mixture of Gaussians works really well when your data is noise free, right? But uh, remember that I keep coming back to this, that the data typically is noisy. And when the data is noisy, T distributions are actually much more robust in their estimation. And there's this uh, really nice algorithm, and I posted the paper in Canvas um, uh, for that, that allows you to learn T distributions and be robust to some noise and mostly Gaussian noise, but noise nonetheless. Um, and here you have the definition of the T distribution. This is the classical gamma function. If you don't remember gamma function, it would be this one uh, for just simple numbers. 
and this one right here um, you know for the uh, continuous case and this is, uh, determines a degree of freedom of that distribution and here you have examples of the T distribution compared to a Gaussian right um, this is a multivariate um, distribution that we've seen before okay and I'm not going to go through the details again you have the paper in canvas um, but uh, here is the mixture of this of this uh, multivariate T distributions that we have introduced, right? So the priors, the densities here, with these three parameters. Remember, B here corresponds to that degree of freedom that ends up being here. And then these are the mean and covariance matrix. Now we can compute the log likelihood. And the log likelihood would be the log likelihood of the priors times the log likelihood of the parameters of each density times the log likelihood of this um, degrees of freedom. If we com compute the log likelihood, then this is the sum, right? And for each of them, remember, this is actually uh, should be pretty easy for you to derive right now. The log likelihood, for example, of the priors, nothing else than the sum, right, of the log of every prior times the latent variable, right? that relates, remember the latent variable relates which simple vector, simple feature vector we have corresponds to each of the models, right, in the mixture. Um, so that's obvious, this is the same that we derive for the normal distribution for the T. The E step corresponds to the expectation, so here are the, uh, is the equations with the specific derivations and this uh, here you have the EM step, okay, the maximization step. So again, um, I don't know that this is implemented in MATLAB, I doubt, but you have here the equations if you want to implement this. Um, these are the equations for factor analysis that are related to that. Uh, there's another method called probabilistic PCA that's basically factor analysis by another name. Um, just extends PCA to uh, to include this latent variables and the noise. So just to let you know that that exists. And um, oh, here's a better example. Oh no, it's not. All right. Um, so let me show you maybe a couple of examples uh, of things that you can do with this. Um, in your project, in one of your projects, you had images of objects, right? Like faces, cars, uh, tomatoes, what have you. And the way we compute, or, or the way we defined rather the feature space was by using what's in computer vision called the appearance based model um, or approach, which takes the first pixel of the image and considers this the first entry of my feature vector. The second pixel is the second uh, entry of the vector, and so on, right? So it looks something like this, right, with this big pixel. Um, and then we just use some, some metric in our uh, space to determine to which uh, sample another sample corresponds to, which class the sample corresponds to. There is a fundamental problem with this um, approach, and that is that objects are three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, right? So here we are assuming that faces are planar and, and frontal. But if you rotate a face, then the 2D information that or a shape that you observe, uh, if you've taken image processing, you'll know all about it, right? A varies, right? It's equivalent to an affine transformation or a projective transformation. And here are just two simple examples of this, right? So for example, if I have this uh, face right here in 3D space and I take a frontal image, that's what I would observe. But if the face is likely rotated downwards, right, tilt the face down, this is the image I would obtain. And if I place it here, you see that they are not aligned anymore, even though I may think that they are. Um, now, I could realign them, then, and then obviously the pixels that I realign don't correspond to the exact same thing, because I'm actually squeezing or enlarging pixels. And we've talked about this before. In, if you rotate it in this other direction, then uh, the same uh, is true, right? The center of the eyes, for example, move to other positions. So uh, one way to solve this um, 
Yes, and, and this is this is why it's so important to understand the physics and the reality of your world. And I keep mentioning that it's very important to know the assumptions uh, that, that you take, and that this assumption be based on some reality, on some physics of the real world. So if we know that in this case, what I can do, I can actually for a given image like this one, right? I can generate these different images here, the variation of the affine transformations that I may observe, right? You can just try an affine transformation to the original image and obtain a bunch of them. And then that now instead of just having one single feature vector here, I'm gonna have a variety of feature vectors each for each of these synthetically generated images. And now I can use a Gaussian model or some other uh, model to determine the distribution of those points, right? And a Gaussian may not be sufficient and I may want to use a mixture of Gaussians, right? And that actually ends up to, uh, working really well to define this uh, phases. So again, I'm gonna post this in Canvas so you can take a look at this. More recently, people have done this even for 3D phases, right? You can model both the shape and the texture or the uh, shading of, of the faces and then uh, make them um, uh, synthetic images that include in your simple set, right, the face as seen from every possible orientation, uh, and, and that would allow you to learn uh, with, with the methods that we've already introduced, learn the underlying distribution of the data. Um, another extension of all this that we have seen this uh, last couple weeks is a mixture of principal components analysis, right? So PCA, as we have defined it thus far, uh, corresponds to uh, a linear model, right? Now, we'll talk about nonlinear models, manifolds, when we go into, when we talk about regression, okay? And as I said, a couple weeks. Uh, but a, a way, a, a way t an intermediate way to solve this problem is to actually use a mixture of PCs right, of PCAs. And here you just have the derivation, so you start with the same idea, right? My density is nothing else than the mixture of many densities, right, G densities, so PJ corresponds to each of the densities, J density that I have, times a prior. Um, I'm going to include the covariance matrix is, you, as you know, a W times W transpose. You can also include the noise term if you want to, right? And then you do the derivations that are shown here on the left. And these are the derivations for the priors, for the mean, uh, for the covariance matrix, and the corresponding latent variables that you're going to need to, to do these derivations. Um, so in one of your projects, you're asked to, uh, given an image, <coughs> to find a PCA or an ICA representation that allows you to reduce the uh, representation feature space, the dimensionality of the feature space of that object, but then be able to reconstruct it, right? So if you use PCA, for example, in this original image at each of these squares, that's the reconstruction that you get, right? Just pretty bad. Um, but if you use a mixture of PCs, this is what you can get, right? So again, you don't get the entire manifold, but at least you get linear components of that manifold, right? It's piecewise linear, so it's better. Um, this is for um, character or a digit recognition. If you, this were a, a problem of recognizing the digits zero to nine. And in that case, each of these columns corresponds to one of the means of the principal components, okay? So one of these mu i's that I have here, uh, right? One of these mu's corresponding to the different um, mixtures, uh, mix different models, right? So you can see that the means correspond to, for example, for the number zero, correspond to the number zero at different orientations, different shapes, different styles of writing the number, right? And the same is true for one and so on. So you can apply this to do, uh, for generative methods where you reconstruct objects or you generate new images of an object. You can use that for classification as you have done in both of your projects, okay? <coughs> Obviously, this can also be applied to discriminant analysis, right? 
to remember this uh, famous equation that I've given you, that discriminant analysis maximizes this criterion shown here. So you want to find the V or the many Vs if it's um, more than one eigenvector or more one than basis vector, I should say. It would be capital V where the columns of capital V are these basis vectors. And you want to maximize this metric and minimize this metric, right? And we've talked a lot about how to define these metri metrics and um, which ones work when. Uh, another solution to, to, or another alternative for this metric is to use a mixture of Gaussians instead of a single Gaussian, right? Um, so these are the metrics of LDA that we've discussed before. And when you use a mixture of Gaussians, it's called subclass discriminant analysis. And it uses the idea of dividing each class into subclasses, which uh, with each subclass represented by one of the models in your mixture, right? So for example, here, um, in this problem that you have here in this plot, if you have two classes, say class one here in red, that's the density of class one, and this two Gaussians correspond to the density of class two, so it correspond to a mixture of Gaussians. Then if I were to compute LDA, that's a result that you obtain, which is less than optimal, right? If I were to use SDA because I know that this is a mixture, then this is the result that you obtain, which is the correct result, uh, the base optimal result. Um, that can be solved by simply changing the between classes scatter matrix that we have introduced for what we call the between subclasses scatter matrix. Where now, remember that before, we only had this, right? the sum of from one to C, the number of classes of this, but now we add another summation term that specifies the subclasses for each of the classes, right? Okay. And that's then the same set of equations that we have used that leads to this very nice uh, system of equations that we can solve as an eigenvalue decomposition. The problem with this is how do you determine the number of subclasses, right? Which is the same problem that we have in clustering. And there are two ways that you can do that, right? One way, um, using methods that we have already discussed. One way that we can do that is by using cross-validation. Remember cross-validation? So you can use cross-validation to determine what is the number of subclasses, subclass divisions, that is going to maximize the log likelihood, right? Or the classification, or minimize the classification error if that's what I'm computing, right? The expected error, the empirical error, remember all that? Um, so that's one way, but that's computationally expensive. I mean, really, really expensive to compute all this, right? Um, another solution that we have already seen is to use that conflict number that uh, we introduced. Remember that um, you can compute the eigenvectors of the metric to be maximized and the metric to be minimized. And then you compute the inner product, which is nothing else than the cosine of the angle between these two. So this tells you how similar these uh, two metrics are. And what do you want? You want the solution of these two metrics to be identical, right? To give you the same solution. Because there is a theorem in that paper that shows when that's the case, then you're guaranteed to have a good solution, OK? You have uh, the base optimal solution. So what is the number of subclasses that you need to select? Well, you need to select the number of subclasses that actually maximizes this criterion. Simple as that, right? And there's a simple uh, optimization algorithm. And with that, you can um, solve for this. So this is an application um, that we had years ago, uh, just to give you an idea. And we'll see this application later on in the course with more modern methods. It uh, gives, obviously, even better results. But this was the first time that we, could, we had an algorithm to do not only detection of faces, but also detection of eyes and the corners of the eyes and the nose, the corners of the nose, and so on. The problem with uh, machine learning algorithms for detecting, say, faces is that you need to detect the face as accurately as possible, right? You want a good detection. Um, so the way you can do that is by finding here in blue the mixture of models that represents faces. 
And in yellow, it's shown here the mixture of models that corresponds to misaligned or imprecisely detected faces, right? And then you want to, using Bayes, you can find a solution for a test sample that gives you, or test image rather, uh, that gives you the uh, ideal detection, the precise detection of the face, the eyes, the nose, and so on. And this is back in 2008, as I said, um, you know, the detection that we could do uh, back at that time with this very simple algorithm, just to give you an idea. Now you'll see this may seem really good or really bad to you, depending where you come from. You'll see that the results that we can get with more modern algorithms that we will introduce in a few weeks are even better than that, okay? Much better. All right. More things related to all of this that we've covered, because we've covered so much ground already. Um, remember that at the early, the first week, I think, of class, I said there are many types of feature spaces, right? Uh, it could be in the real domain, it could be in the complex domain, but it also could be on the surface of a hypersphere, right? Remember that? And that occurs especially when I norm normalized my data, right? And there are many reasons why I want, I want to norm normalize the data. I'm not going to get into the details, but if you take computer vision, for example, for shape analysis, um, if you do norm normalization, that allows you to be robust to a scale. So different scales are represented by, by a, a scalar here, a multiplier. Um, and if you norm normalize your data, you're invariant to scale. In other applications, you may be invariant to the intensity of the illumination. Uh, in bioinformatics, it's also used uh, to normalize the, uh, the intensity of the reading of the activation or, um, or, or bounding of the genes that are described in microarrays. That's very typical. So, and once we talk about kernels and norms, you'll see that um, most kernels are actually also norm normalized. Okay. So the problem is that when you norm normalize the data, you're mapping your data onto that surface of this hypersphere shown here, right? So for example, these are images of the ETH database, right? So um, this would correspond to the different feature vectors. They're now represented in SP minus one, right? So if I start in the real domain of P dimensions um, and I map everything by norm normalizing like this, I now map everything on the surface of a hypersphere. And I want to reiterate, as I said early on, that this is hugely problematic. Um, because now my feature space is not linear. Um, so all the methods that we have introduced do not work for nonlinear feature spaces. Okay. So what's a typical thing that people do? It turns out that the typical thing that people do is they ignore that, right? Uh, they ignore that they are in SP minus one and they think, or they just go on with their computations as if they were still in RP, the real domain of P dimensions. That's obviously mathematically very, very incorrect. <laughs> uh, um, but sometimes it leads to good results, sometimes it leads to really poor results. Um, and if you want to understand why that occurs, I have given you here some information to uh, go through. So let me briefly um, summarize what I have included here so you can use it uh, in your machine learning um, algorithms once you are out in the world applying this to real problems, exciting problems. Now, the reason the algorithms that we have derived become really complex once you go into the surface of a hypersphere is because the Gaussian distribution is not defined on the surface of a hypersphere, right? Uh, the Gaussian distribution is defined in the real space, in Cartesian space. Um, there are other distributions like the von Mises Fischer, which is probably the simplest distribution, they're specifically designed or derived <coughs> for a spherical, dis uh, spherical uh, feature spaces. So here in red, this is S1, right? So this is the spherical space of one dimension, okay? So instead of having just the line that goes to negative infinity and plus infinity on each side, now I have a line 
right, that goes all around the circle. Uh, the von Mises Fisher distribution is given like this. It's an exponential function, right? Like the normal distribution. So it's very similar to a normal distribution, as you'll see here. And it has two parameters. One is the mean, right? Like the Gaussian. The mean tells me where I'm at in this sphere, right? So it's basically a vector that points into the direction of the center of the distribution. And then it has a kappa here that's a concentration parameter that tells me how wide, how concentrated the data is, which is equivalent to the variance of the Gaussian. Okay? So this is the von Mises Fischer with this mean right here and different kappas uh, for parameters. So now you see the Gaussian, when you have a Gaussian, right? Remember the Gaussian distribution in 1D looks something like this. We always draw it like this. Of course, it's not exactly like this because this goes on, right? This doesn't stop in this direction, in that direction. But obviously, I, I can never reach infinity or negative infinity. Um, so I cannot draw the whole thing, right, ever. But that density goes on forever, right? Um, well, the same is true here. It goes on forever, right? It just happens that eventually you go around the circle, right? Um, but it's the same, the same idea. So you can see um, that for some densities like this one that's very small, right? It's almost another circle on top of that because obviously the density here is almost identical to the density here. Um, so. Why don't we just use this distribution, change or, or plug this distribution into the equations that we have derived thus far, right? So um, for mixture models, uh, instead of using the Gaussian or the T distribution that I've given you the derivations for, you use the von Mises Fisher, right? And you're done. Um, true, you could do that. That's the obvious solution, but there is a problem, as always, is this little guy here. Remember what this is? What's this called? The normalizing constant, very good. This is called the normalizing constant. And why do we have this? Because the volume under the curve has to be equal to one, right? Um, the problem is that because I'm in a nonlinear Space now, this normalizing constant is really, really ugly. <laughs> um, and it cannot be computed. It just can't. Uh, there is no known way to compute that. There are ways to get approximations of this uh, normalizing constant using optimization algorithms, but we just can't compute the normalizing constant. So um, unfortunately, we cannot plug this in into all the algorithms that we have derived. Otherwise, it would be easy. It would, it would be done. Um, there's another distribution we may want to use. It's called the Bigman distribution. It's very similar to the von Mises Fisher, but this one is symmetric uh, like this. So um, you see if you have this um, concentration here of the density, you have the same concentration down here. Okay. Um, again, it's an exponential function, very similar to to the Gaussian distribution. This is actually um, almost, you can almost estimate this because the parameters are here in that matrix A. This is a parameter matrix. And it turns out that the eigenvectors of A can be easily estimated. So that is solvable up to scale because the eigenvalues can't, okay? so. It's, you get closer with this, but you, it's not, you can't estimate that distribution either. Um, so again, there's no hope. Um, there's the Fisher-Bigman, or mostly called the Kent distribution. Um, this is the most similar to the Gaussian um, in, in that space. Again, th th its parameters cannot be estimated in close form. Um, so what are we to do? All right, here's where the concept of 
spherical homocysticity comes in. Remember homocysticity? What does homocysticity mean? Same variance, right? So it means that exactly, that if I have uh, two distributions, right, say like this in 2D, that their means mu1 and mu2 may be different, but that their covariance matrices are exactly the same, right? Okay, um, a spherical homocydastic, uh, it's not exactly this, but more or less, it means that they're identical up to a rotation in the sphere, okay, the hypersphere. So why is that important? Well, homocydastic distributions are very important because, anyone can remind me why they are important? Because what happens? The what's a linear boundary, correct? The what classifier? The base classifier, very good. The base classifier, right? It's linear, it's a hyperplane, right? We can easily compute that. So the base classifier can be computed when the distributions are homocydastic Gaussians. Great. Um, it turns out that then when they are homocydastic up to a rotation, you, don't, you no longer have a hyperplane, obviously. It's impossible, right? Because when they are not homocydastic, right, when they are something like this, remember, there's something like this, then the classification boundary is a quadratic function, right? Because of the Gaussian uh, equation, which is a quadratic uh, equation. But it turns out that this quadratic equation collapses when they are up to rotation, homocystic up to rotation. And what happens is that, for example, between these two, it turns out that you have two hyperplanes. One is this one here, and this one, the second one is over here. And say for these two, it will be this hyperplane here and this one, right? So you have two hyperplanes. What we showed, it was proven several years ago, is that this hyperplane is outside your feature space, meaning it does not intersect with the hypersphere SP minus one. If it, does not, if it does not intersect with the hypersphere, it has no meaning in classification. You can ignore it. So for, uh, to you, this second hyperplane is irrelevant. You don't care. It doesn't matter that there are two hyperplanes. As far as you're concerned, there is one hyperplane that matters, period. So. For homocydastic Gaussians in the hypersphere, then the problem is solvable linearly, right? Now, for since we don't have the Gaussian in the sphere, you have to talk about von Mises, Fischer, Bigman, and Ken. And I've given you here the conditions that they have that you have to have for them to be spherical homocydastic. Okay, for VMF, Bigman, and Ken, uh, these things have to uh, hold, but in that case, they are spherical homocydastic, which means that they, that they are separable with a hyperplane. And there's this beautiful theorem in the paper that I'll post in Canvas that shows that if you have two, I mean, this is, this is fascinating to me still to this day. Uh, if, if you have two spherical homocydastic, either VMFs or Bigman or Kent or anything else, right? any distribution defined in the surface of a hypersphere. You have two spherical homostatic distributions on the sphere, and you assume that your data is in RP, not in SP minus one, but the data is in RP, and you estimate your densities with Gaussians in RP, and you compute the base classifier, and then you get these two hyperplanes, and the one that's outside the sphere, you ignore it. Then the classifier in the SP minus one space is base optimal, 
<laughs> so the base optimal classifier in the uh, a sphere of p minus 1 dimensions is computable. You can compute it like this. And it's straightforward. We just compute the Gaussian distributions, right, as we've been doing. Uh, you solve the base equation, the base classification boundary the, of the log likelihood, and you're done. Um, this is fascinating to me to this day, uh, that this is actually possible. Um, now, what happens if your data is not a spherical homostatistic, right? Your densities are not spherical homostatistic, because that's going to happen more often than not. Well, here's what's going to happen. All right, let's go back to the base error. Imagine that you have two distributions defined on the surface of a hypersphere, sp minus 1, the blue one and the red one, OK? Now, what's shown here, and I mean, this is exaggerated, obviously, for illustration, but what's shown here in um, this um, green uh, area, or this uh, green bar area, is the base error, correct? Right? OK. Now, what happens if I assume that my data, oh, and one more thing, then the base classifier, right, would be this one and this one here. Uh, this one, right, because this density is large, it's bigger here than this one. And on this side, this one is smaller than this one, right? That's a base classifier. And the same happens here. You see, the red has more density than the blue, right? That's a base classifier. Now, what we need to understand is what happens if I were to estimate it with Gaussians. With Gaussians, I would obtain, uh, you see this dotted line here, or dotted ellipse? That would be the corresponding estimate of the density for this distribution, but with a Gaussian. And the dotted ellipse, that, uh, the red dotted ellipse, correspond to the Gaussian of the samples coming from that spherical distribution, OK? And if you compute the base classifier, that's your base classifier right here, OK? This is the base classifier. <laughs> it's a nonlinear base classifier, obviously. Um, so what happens when you do that is that the base classifier for this Gaussians, right? See where it intersects the hypersphere right here? And right there, that gives you the classification boundary, right? That's the base classification boundary on the hypersphere. So this is the base classifier shown here in solid line uh, of the uh, Gauss given by the Gaussian estimate, and the dashed line corresponds to the true one. Okay. Now you see this little area right here and right here. This is the added error that you. Uh, sum over the base error, right? So this is what's called the reducible error. That I can, re I can eliminate it, I can reduce that error by moving my classification boundary onto the actual base classifier. But because I've assumed that the data is Gaussian, I have added that error. And the question is, how much error do I add when my distributions are not homo uh, spherical homostatistic? And this is what happens. So let's see if we can unpack this. This is the reducible or the probability of reducible error. Okay. Uh, and this is for von Mises Fisher distributions in the hypersphere. So this is p. P is the dimensionality of my data, right? And this is the ratio of kappa 1 over kappa, or kappa 2 over kappa 1, right? The two densities, OK, or concentrations. Now you see that when my data uh, is of a small dimensionality, right? Then there is a huge jump as this ratio increases. And what does this ratio indicate? This ratio indicates deviation from homostaticity, right? Or from spherical homostaticity. Because if they were identical, that would be one, right? That would be here, right? And it would be zero error because they're spherical homostaticity. But as soon as they start deviating, this huge jump in the reducible error. And then that starts reducing and it saturates about here. So 
you add about, what is it, about 1% of reducible error, which is not too bad. But even better news is that when I keep increasing the dimensionality of my space, because obviously I've kept, I keep m the number of samples fixed, right? Then that reducible error actually decreases dramatically, right? So the higher the dimensionality of your space, the less concerned you should be with that. And obviously, the closer to, the, to homocysticity, uh, the more you should care about it. Um, for Bigman distributions, it's the opposite. The more I deviate from homocysticity, the more I should care about it, okay? Because that error increases, although it's small, but it increases. And this is, uh, what's this? This is for Bigman as well. All right, jump ahead. This is for the Kant. And for the Kant distribution, again, the more I deviate from homocysticity, the more it increases. Still a small, right? I mean, we're talking about a 2% additional error, right? It's not too bad, all right? So that means that we can still apply all these methods to a spherical data but we just have to be cognizant of what that means, and we have to know what amount of reducible error I have. So here's the thing. Um, in machine learning, uh, you will see, the more you work on this, uh, when you have a new problem, right, and you want to do, say, classification. Let's talk about classification for, for a second, right? So I want to classify objects, whatever it is, words, uh, sounds, or images, or DNA, or uh, communication signals, what have you, right? Into a certain number of categories, okay? I want to classify them. Then, when I do that, uh, I'm going to have a classification error, right? I'm going to do it pretty well most of the time, but sometimes a percentage of my testing samples or verification samples are going to be misclassified. And remember, that's called the classification error, right? Or empirical error. Now, in machine learning, you will see that getting, designing an algorithm with the algorithms that we are, are defining, that works about 60% of the time in most reasonable problems, right? Not very complicated problems like a self-driving car, but most reasonable problems that you encounter uh, every day in engineering, getting 60% classification accuracy is actually pretty easy, okay? 70% it's a little hard, but it's doable. 80%, that's when things start to get interesting, right? It gets harder. Uh, 90% it's tough, right? That's, but then after 90%, every step counts, right? Every little addition to that 90% is really hard. 91 is hard. 92 is harder. 93 is even harder, right? It keeps getting harder and harder and harder to, to improve your results. If you know that there is an additional 2%, because the base error you don't know, remember? So you don't know, that's, that's the main problem that we have. You don't know how accurate you can get. Is the, the maximum 95 or 98? I don't know, what's the base error? If the base error is 2%, <laughs> then I could get to 98. But if on top of that, I have another 2% given by this, right? Then it's 96. <laughs> but if I have no idea, if I'm just, shooting blanks, I have, I, I'm lost. I'm at 96 and I'm really trying to get the 98 and I don't know, I can't, but I'm just trying desperately for months and I'm just getting frustrated for no reason, right? So knowing these things is extremely important, extremely useful. Okay. All right. Um, any questions? Bore seems a little dark today, right? I don't know. Okay. Can you see it well? Still? It's a little dark, isn't it? Yeah, can someone check the lights, see if there is another thing? There's a, there was a problem with the lights earlier today because of the storm. So I'm wondering 
Okay, I'll try to draw larger letters <laughs> today. If someone can check, uh, I don't know, press a few buttons, see if something improves. <laughs> All right, so let's review really fast um, everything we've seen because, by gosh, we have covered a lot of ground already, and we're only one third in, right? <laughs> okay, so remember, in machine learning, we have a very simple problem, right? which is we are given two uh, variables, two random variables, x and y, right? And our goal is to find a function, whoops, wrong one, is to find a function that makes this equal to that, right? Um, we've talked a lot about how to estimate this underlying function as a density, right? And this is what we've called the probabilistic methods. Okay, and so. Um, this is some PDF, or it's a distribution given by some PDF better. It's a distribution that's given by some PDF. And that PDF, obviously, you understand, I hope by now, that if I'm in a feature space and I know my density, right? So if I know that the density of my symbols is this, then I know exactly what to expect, right? So, for example, if I only have one density for one class, then I can generate as many samples, new samples as I want, right? If I have the density, correct? So there are multiple ways to do that. These are called generative methods for that reason. There are multiple ways to do that. So for example, in PCA, if I'm in RP, in PCA what we do, we compute a subspace, right? That contains most of my samples, or that approximates my samples in a least square sense. And that allows me to now come to that PCA space and say, you see that point here, which does not represent any of my samples? Now this new vector, x, I can bring it back into an image or into a sound or into a what have you, right, a gene, by simply, if this is vq, right, by simply reprojecting it back into my original space, right? bring it back into, um, let's call it x tilde. But I could also do it here, right? So if I, have, um, if I have a number of samples that I'm given, and that has allowed me to estimate that distribution, now I can come here and say, you see this point right here? Um, this has to belong to that distribution, or this belongs to this distribution, therefore this has to be simple from that, uh, from that distribution for whatever that distribution represents. And I can draw samples from it as well, right? Now, most interestingly, if I work in the, um, in the latent space, then I can draw samples from my latent space Z and reconstruct them as x, right? By using my mixing matrix and my noise, right? Correct? So all these methods are called generative methods because they allow me to generate as many samples as I want. Once I know the density or the subspace, right? The some information about my data, then I can generate as many samples as you want. 
in PCA, what people usually do to go beyond what you have done in your homework is once I have my PCA space here, I can now compute the normal distribution, the Gaussian, that best estimates my samples projected on the PCA space, or even better, the mixture of Gaussians that estimates this, right? And now I'm drawing samples from here. And the same happens in the latent space Z, the same happens here, right? Now, this is very nice. Um, but however, um, I have to say that, that one of the problems with, that we have already observed with um, these methods is that the dimensionality of the feature space may be too large for us, right? Because if P, if here P is significantly larger, say much larger than N, which is typically the case, not always, but it's typically the case, uh, then I need to find a solution. And one solution that we, or several solutions we've discussed are PCA, right? PCA allows us to reduce the dimensionality of our feature space, right? That's one of the big advantages. In fact, we've discussed if I only have n samples, doesn't matter what P is, because n samples can only represent at maximum n minus one dimensions, right? So. I could project these to n minus one dimensions and not lose anything. It just doesn't matter. If we only have two feature vectors, it can only define a one-dimensional space, right? Uh, and so on. So PCA is very useful for this. And it's obviously optimal with regard to uh, this uh, concept. ICA is another way to solve this problem that we have discussed. Factor analysis, another way to solve this problem, right? We have also talk briefly that you can use a mixture of PCs in the same way you can use a mixture of IC, ICs of, or FAs. Um, you can use a mixture of Gaussians here, but again, if P is too large, um, then that's problematic. There's another, so, so um, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about PCA because probably it's the easiest. Um, why, wh what, what concept are we using to reduce the dimensionality from P to Q dimensions with PCA, right? So with PCA, we go from P dimensions to Q. What concept, what criterion do we use to do that? Anyone remembers? No, no, that's a, the method. What's a criterion that we use? Least squares, very good, which leads us to, which are which the same as what? It determines what? Uh, least squares a lot. Um, mm -mm. No. Um, so the problem is with this P, right? P can be very large. Okay. Uh, why can I reduce the dimensionality of P? So how about this case? Imagine I have this case, and these are my symbols. Right? Can I reduce the dimensionality of this two-dimensional space to one? Why? But why? Yes. What's that? Variance? No, no, no. Correlations. Correlations. Who said that? <laughs> All right, someone said that. Uh, correlations, right? Because this variable, this random variable, is correlated with this one, meaning that there is a m functional mapping, right? So if this I call x1 and this I call x2, then there's a functional mapping that given x1, I know the value of x2. So, and that functional mapping uh, for linear correlations is uh, a linear function. Right? Um, so that's what correlations allows me to do. It allows me to determine 
what is the relationship, so to speak, right, between my variables, okay? Um, all right, um, this, is -linear, this is linear correlations. Nonlinear correlations led us to ICA, right? I see it's nothing else than PCA, basically, in essence, but for nonlinear correlations, remember? Um, but are there other ways? And the answer is, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be asking. Uh, and there is a way to find them. And that, uh, that method it's, or falls within what's called graphical models. So that's the next topic I want to cover in the next couple of lectures. Okay, so graphical models. Now, graphical models means that we are going to define our variables using a graph. And to see how, let's start with basic definitions, okay? Now, anyone knows who invented this idea of graph? You're gonna be shocked. I mean, totally shocked. Like a completely unknown person. <laughs> Euler, remember Euler? <laughs> oh, it's seriously, right? <laughs> These people, it, 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 I don't know. It's incredible the, the amount of amazing work that they produced. Um, so Euler was interesting in what we would call today the trouble salesman problem, right? So it's if you have a number of cities, okay, and I want to go to all of them without visiting all, uh, each one twice, right? I only want to visit each town once, okay? And there are specific roads that connect the towns, okay? Um, in fact, Eul in o Euler time, um, or in Euler's paper, in his first paper, he uh, talked about the bridges of his hometown, right? So his hometown had a lot of bridges and he wanted to cross the river using all the bridges but only going through each bridge once, right? I bet it's the same idea. Um, so that led us to graphs, so the towns being what we call today vertices or nodes and the roads, the edges, okay? So Let's see that. Let's start with, uh, basic definition, with this basic definition of graph. So a graph I'm going to define a graph as G of V E. These are capital letters. Um, so a graph G V E is given by is given by a set of vertices my set uh, again the vertices can be called nodes some people call them points I it's just, I don't understand why you use the notation but anyways um, I, I usually use nodes or vertices um, and these are um, formally given by this V, right? So V, where I have my set of vertices, call it small v1 through a small vn, say. Okay, and, oh, there we go. All right, we'll try to get the lights on, back on. All right, okay. It's a stormy day. Um, and the connections between them, which we're going to define in our set capital E that goes from E1 to E and N should be, oh, actually one, one, obviously, E and N. Okay, where, 
EIJ is the edge Right, the edge or the connection. Uh, edge are also known sometimes as links, same thing. It's the edge between VI and VJ. Okay. So it means I have some nodes, so usually represented with circles or with dots. Right, and then the edges are represented with lines between them, right? Something like that. Okay, so these are the nodes or vertices VI, VJ, and this would be EIJ, right? Make sense? Now, in the most general definition, E, capital E, may not include all the edges. It will only include the edges that are present in my graph. So maybe I have 1, 3, 2, 3, I don't know, 2, 4, and so on, right? Whatever it is. And then in that case, people will write the number of elements of E, right, is equal to some number, right? Let's call it, what do I call it? Um, hmm. I don't know, I don't give it a number, but say Q, right? And the same can be done with the vertices. We've said that we have N vertices, right? Uh, another way, an alternative way that is usually preferred, is to actually include all of them, in which case this would be n squared. You include all of them where Eij is equal to 1 if there is an edge. between VI and VJ and zero otherwise, right? And it makes more sense, and you agree? In that case, you can actually represent your graph in a matrix form, and that's called the adjac adjacency matrix. where capital E now, it's given by E11 through E1N, and then EN1, ENN, right? And that just means each row represents one vertex, vertex and each column another uh, vertex, right? That's it. Uh, adjacency matrices, uh, we're going to talk about those uh, quite a lot. So, something to keep in mind. All right, any questions about this? Um, all right, so this is a graph. Remember, very important to remember this notation. This one, right, the number of elements in, or uh, number of edges and vertices. The adjacency matrix that we have here. Um, and this graph G, right, this graph G can be directed or undirected. Now the one I've drawn here is an undirected graph because all I know, or all I have, is that there is a edge between VI and VJ, right? But then, and if this is undirected like this, that means that in my adjacency matrix is symmetric. 
Okay? Because going from 1 to 2, it's the same than going from 2 to 1. Right? There's no difference going this direction or that direction. The same edge. But I can also have directed graphs, right? In which case, I have to specify a direction a direction of that edge, right? So the edge can have one of the two possible directions. In which case, this matrix is no longer symmetric, right? So for undirected and for directed, remember that the adjacency matrix is going to be symmetric and this one you don't know but not necessarily okay not necessarily symmetric it could be but it's not necessarily symmetric So let's give a more formal definition of these two. We're going to give first definition an undirected graph is given by a set of edges. E, right, with Eij equal to Eji. Or you can say equivalently with a symmetric adjacency matrix. Okay? And the other one is that a directed graph. is given by a set E of directed edges, i.e., if you prefer, that Eij may or may not be equal to EJI, okay? So far so good? Make sure everything is clear because as always, things get exponentially complicated. All right, so I could have a very special type of graph called a fully connected graph. A fully connected graph. Okay. As its name implies, a fully connected graph is one for which, excuse me, for which EIJ is, anyone? Different than zero for every IJ pair. Right? Now, one is a correct answer if we're talking about that option um, right here. But in more general terms, EIJ can take any value. Okay? Right? Good. All right. A 
a click is a fully connected graph Okay, it's a fully connected subset, excuse me, or subgraph if you prefer. Subset capital S of the vertices capital V or IE, more formally, all VI and vj with eij different than zero okay again you can say equal to one if we can only take zero one in a more general case if we can take any value between zero and one then it have to be different than zero okay when a click is not contained in another larger click, that is called a maximal click. Okay. A click as not contain. Uh, in or within another click or I'd say another larger click let's call it S prime and by larger I obviously mean that S is smaller than S prime right Clicks are usually represented by an N by K matrix, capital C, that includes the edges, E11 through E1N, up to K, defining my click, E, um, N, K. No, what did I say? 1K, oh, this, this is wrong. Uh, if this is 1k, this is n1, right? There we go. And this is nk. And k here, it's the number of maximal click, or the elements in the maximal click. Obviously, all cijs in this matrix, right? All the entries of that matrix have to be different than zero. Otherwise, I would not define a click, right? Okay. A path A path, let's call it capital P, for example. Oh, goodness me. Really? <laughs> what a day, huh? All right. A path um, P between, between two vertices, VI and VJ is a sequence of vertices connecting VI with VJ. Oh, gee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a sequence of vertices connecting or going from V1 to VJ with every edge different than zero. 
okay? So I have P here and define it as V1 prime all the way to Vd prime of length d in that case, right? Where v1 prime has to be equal to vi and vd prime equal to vj and anything else in between, right? But the edges have to be, have to exist, have to be different than zero. Now, for an undirected graph, the vertices have to be different than zero for, I'm sorry, the edges. For a directed graph, you have to keep the directionality, right? So the edge has to be from V1 prime to V2 prime, right? It cannot be the edge between V2 prime and V1 prime because that would define a different path, right, in a directed graph. Let's keep that in mind. All right, that will lead us to the next really important definition, which is a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, which is fundamental for many things we're gonna do, Bayesian networks, and deep learning when we get to that, uh, which is just DAGs. All right, until next time, hopefully with the lights on. <laughs>